picture from the point of view of technology, but also from the point of view of um, teams, data teams, and, and, and uh, how, to, how to organize what to focus on. So let's get started. Spark is general engine for distributed data processing. It has an API for all these languages. You are probably mostly interested in Python. Uh, but the whole point is you implement your business logic in one of these languages and Spark takes care of distributing the processing. So it's not a database. You can feed Spark with data from multiple sources. Spark takes care of processing it in distributed way. And let's get started with some use cases. Let's imagine you're building a mobile app and you have some backend which talks to the mobile app and talks to some database. And from now on, you would like to improve your application. And you do that by collecting information of what your users are doing. So whether they scroll through the screen, they click on the, uh, on the button, they go through, through some payment forms, you collect all of that so you can connect your analysts to that database and understand what happened with the given user. Like why didn't he buy premium? Is it because the application was too complex? Is, did the payment form fail or maybe the application has crashed? And so far, so good. You collect these events, your company is growing, you, you get more customers. You connect more, more analysts to, um, to, um, to the database with events. But at some point, you're doing so well that you have some technical problems to solve. So basically, the number of upcoming event to, events to the database is too much to handle for, for a single machine. And you have to simply do something with that. So fortunately, these kind of problems are well known. And the general idea is that you you distribute, di distribute the storage, you distribute, distribute the processing, and quite a uh, quite common way of doing that is storing the events into Hadoop, which is distributed file system, uh, then exposing your analysts to Spark, which is distributing processing systems. And of course, there are many ways of doing that, uh, but for today, we are going to focus on the Spark part. So uh, from now on, uh, a data analyst is exposed to Spark API. So what does it look like? Well, we are not going to go through many details. I just want to focus on, uh, on the keywords, which are like group by, max, average, join, select. If you, do, if you know SQL, if you know Pandas, it's super easy to, to start with it. So Spark API is really not a problem to, to, to start with. There are, there are some gotchas, but not really about the API. The API is simple. And once you have this kind of API, you can express all kinds of general use cases. ETL, extract, transform, load. So you have multiple data sources in multiple formats. You basically crunch them together. You build a single source of truth for analytical purposes. Calculating. KPIs, or so, so you know how well you are doing with acquisition, you know how well you are doing with, with the revenue. And many, many other general use cases, calculating A-B test results, anonymizing your large data sets because you care about privacy and GDPR and stuff like that, calculating fraud, churn statistics, calculating um, machine learning features uh, for your models many other use cases like that, but I'm not going to many details. I'm going to show you two more, which are a little bit more specific and a little bit more complex. So telco network improvement. As a customer of telco, you hold your phone, you travel around, and you get connected to one of the, of the base stations. And depends on which base station you are connected to, you get different performance, different throughput, and you want to simply improve that. Because the, the idea is that a happier customer is the customer which is more likely to stay with you. So if you want to do that, there are multiple steps to, to be done. 
you need to understand the current network quality, so you have to come up with some score. You need to see if there is any relationship between churn and the network quality. You need to simulate the new network, the network after the upgrade, based on the hardware you are buying. And by the end of the day, you can connect the dots and, um, and simulate what will happen with churn if you improve the network and whether it's worth it or not and where exactly you want to improve the network. So, four steps, easy, right? It's not that easy. It's not easy from the point of view of, um, of the domain. You need to understand a lot and that's kind of your homework. But what Spark can help you with is processing all that data because we are talking about huge data sets. We are talking about at least terabytes of data uh, from the network. The probes are coming every, every few minutes uh, for every single customer. And that uh, Spark will help you because what you want to do, you want to do all these four steps and it's a kind of iterative process. You experiment, you, you try what's going on, then you get a result. You want to do it fast. You want to analyze all your, all your data. And you might ask, Okay, but these kind of activities has been done so far. Uh, so you can take an aggregate of your data, you can take uh, some sample of your data set, and people have been doing that for, for a very long time. So people were pulling the data to their local machines or to some super strong Python server. But when you do that, you might end up with this blind man and an elephant problem. So a few blind men are touching an elephant and they get completely different idea what an elephant is. Completely wrong idea actually. And something similar might happen with, with your data if you just look at part of your data set. If you are using a distributed system instead, you can analyze all the data, you can analyze it faster and the way Spark works, it actually brings the analysis to the data. So you don't need to create any extra copies of your data, which is quite important from the point of view of a GDPR and regulations like that. And one more use case, uh, which is slightly different, is processing geospatial data. So imagine you would like to build a map service like uh, Google Maps or you're building self-driving cars and you need a map which you 100% trust, 100% rely on. And if you do that, you probably need to crunch data from multiple sources, from these, these cars which are, are taking pictures, you blend it with AI to get uh, road names, signs and stuff like that. There are open source geospatial repos you can use. You most likely need an army of editors who will be looking at, at, the, at the map, at, at uh, satellite pictures and basically re reacting for customer uh, bug reports and drawing new perfect map. And it's likely that you want to buy some uh, data from vendors because you know in a given country there is a vendor who has good postal data or, uh, or road data. And what you do afterwards, you take all these sources, you blend it together, you build a new, better version of your map, and you do that over and over again. And what you want to do, you want to iterate fast. And these are just some examples of uh, what kind of operations you could be, you will be doing. It's if you are getting road segments from multiple vendors or from, from multiple sources, then you have to make sure that there is no gap in the road. You have to do some stitching. Or um, you have to update information about brand new coffee house which has just opened. Or you need to update information about access point to the building because you don't really like if you, if you take an Uber and then you have to walk for half a, half a mile. So when you get a map like that, the idea is quite simple. You want to you want to parallelize the processing. You want to parallelize the processing because these kind of operations, some of them, the geospatial operations, are super heavy in terms of CPU. So, so you want to take many CPUs on many machines. So you split the load. You 
gets, uh, so, so the idea of split is quite simple, it's quite easy to implement that on Spark, and this is what it would look like. You will get many JVMs on many machines, each of them will be responsible for processing part of your map. So the quick recap of the use cases, you want to consider a system like Spark if you have some massive data sets to process, so to process, so to deliver the data, to do some ad hoc analysis on top of it, to build features for machine learning models, or if you have some super heavy, uh, heavy processing, so you, you can employ many CPUs. And if you decide for Spark, you can use SQL-like interface, and this will be analytics friendly, it gives you some high-level function for all kinds of aggregations. Uh, or you can use this functional programming style for more granular control over what you are doing. But this is enough of use cases. Let's do a deep dive into how Spark works and what kind of pitfalls you, you can see. So why, why would you even care how it works? You should care about that because I would like you to have better disaster recovery plan than this. And why are we talking about disaster recovery plans? It is just quite common that when I work with clients, they can very easily express the business logic in Spark because as I said, it's simple. The API is quite simple, but then they go to, uh, to some large data sets and they see some errors and then it's not that easy to, to understand it if you, if you are new to, new to Spark. So let's have a look at how it works and uh, at a few common problems you will see if you decide to, to use Spark. So very first thing you have to keep in mind that even though it feels to you that, that you are working with some, uh, some local data set in Spark. The data set is actually partitioned in, on, it, it is on multiple machines. It will be processed on multiple machines. And when Spark runs whatever logic you, um, you created, it will do some transformations. The first one is called narrow transformation. It's quite simple. So let's say, you do two uppercase on a string record. If you do that, you can basically work record by record, partition by, by partition. You don't really have to mix information between multiple partitions. And Spark basically knows that, and it utilizes that information so it can pipeline multiple narrow transformation into a single task. So task will be the most granular unit of execution in Spark, and you will have as many tasks as you have partitions. But things are not always that simple. Sometimes you have to do more complex operations. Sometimes Spark has to do more complex transformations because, for instance, you want to group events by user ID. Then user ID 1 goes to one place, user ID 2 goes to another, and so on. So we are mixing the data between multiple partitions, so the machines basically have to talk to each other, and this oper operation is called shuffle. So from 10,000 feet, the Spark application looks like the following. You have some input data set which is partitioned, which is on multiple machines. Spark tries to pipeline as many simple operations as possible, this is, a, this is called stage, and then it has to do a shuffle because you group by, because you do some kind of aggregation, because you do a join. So then there is a shuffle, then another set of simple transformations, and so on. So we have multiple stages, multiple shuffles, and shuffle is the operation you want to pay attention to because it's quite complex, it's quite heavy from the point of view of I.O. and there are many things which actually can go wrong. But just to give you an overview of how Spark parallelizes the load, let's see the, at the simplest scenario ever. So we read some data from, from Hadoop, from HDFS, 
these data are events, they contain timestamp, time and out of this timestamp you would like to calculate um, year, month and a day columns. So you want to calculate three extra columns out of existing one. So Spark knows it, that these are simple operations, it can be calculated out of, out of the same row. So a task of Spark will read the, some block from HDFS, it will do the calculation on the fly and it will save the data to disk if you request it to. So how many tasks like that will you have? If you have terabyte of data with in thousand files, eight blocks per file, then you will have eight thousand blocks, and that means it will be eight thousand tasks. Eight thousand tasks which look exactly the same. There are no arrows between those tasks. They don't talk to each other because it's simple, it, there is no shuffle here. Uh, and the only difference between them is that it will be reading different chunks of your input data. But it's super easy to parallelize and there is not much which can go wrong here. And all these tasks are run on JVMs called executors. They are somewhere in your cluster. And all of, uh, all of them are orchestrated by a single, single driver process. So let's have a look at something a little bit more complex. Join. You want to join 10 terabytes of events with some small user data sets and you want to do the join based on, uh, based on user ID. So when you do that, what Spark will do, it will organize the data based on the join key, which is user ID in our case. So single Spark task will read some block of data it will organize it into multiple buckets. So bucket one will be responsible for a um, certain set of users, bucket two, and so on. All of them will be written to a local disk, and all the other tasks will do exactly the same. So we have our data organized based on the join key, and then Spark can trigger another set of tasks, which will be pulling that data together. So task one will pull all the buckets one to the same place and it will do the partial join. Same with task two and so on. And the question here will be how many tasks will you have in stage two? It's controlled by this parameter that 200 is the default and why is it important? Because if you do quick back of the envelope calculation, you see that 10 terabytes of event, events, if you split them into uh, 200 tasks, that means 50 gigs per, tasks, per task. So that means each of these tasks will be processing 50 gigs of data. And usually you want to keep your executors small. So what will happen? It might be that Spark will recover from that, so it will spill some data to disk and then it will do external sort. Eventually it will work, but it will be just slow. But it's quite uh, often that you will see timeouts, out of memory, GC problems, uh, stuff like that. So how do you fix that? First of all, you have to understand your data. And that is kind of generic, general comment for whichever system you work with. If you process a lot of data, you have to understand it. I told you how much data you have. I told you what's the distribution, but you have to do the homework. You have to understand, understand it yourself, and you have to find some clues in, in, in the Spark UI. But once you know what the problem is, then you just control the level of parallelism. So you increase the number of tasks until it works reasonably well, let's say. But it is not always that simple. Sometimes you have a skew in your data set. So let's see what happens. If you still have 10 terabytes of events, but one of your user produced one terabyte of them. So you have this like super heavy user, which is let's say some system user. What will happen the algorithm will be exactly the same. 
but one of the tasks will have to process one terabyte of data and there is no chance it will work. So what do you do if you have, have a SKU join like that? First of all, you have to understand where the SKU is coming from. Is your ingestion mechanism off? Did you introduce some bug in, in your pipeline? Or maybe it's just okay and you still want to, want to join it somehow. If that's the, the, the latest one, if you still want to perform the join, there is this simple trick. So let's say here we are joining events with users and you don't like the fact that user ID 1 is so common because all of, all of those records will go to uh, will go to a single task. So what you do, you introduce a salt. You introduce some randomness in, in your data. You generate a random number from let's say one to three for this slide. And for all users, you basically generate every single user with every single possible salt value. So you duplicate your users. And when you perform the join, you do a join based on not only user ID, but also a salt. So user ID 1, salt 1 goes to one place. User ID 1, salt 2 goes to another place. And so on. It might sound a little bit artificial to you, but this is a very common problem and the solution is, I would say, quite easy once you understand what's going on. And since it's a common problem, it's, a, it's basically a nice trick to have in your, let's say, bag, bag of tricks. Uh, so salting or some modification of salting is quite useful with these kind of problems. We do not have too much time. I would be happy to talk about caching. And there are many other, so caching, broadcasting, how to size your uh, executors, how to deal with off heap memory and the containers. I will be very happy to talk to you if you are interested. Uh, the same about really not Spark related problems, but, ba but basically data pipeline related problems and, and machine learning related problems like what file format to choose for a given problem or how to deploy machine learning models to production. That I would be also happy to talk and also to hear to you your experience. But for now, I would like to quickly go through, uh, through the slide I showed you in the beginning. In the beginning, I showed you something like this. So we have uh, Hadoop, Spark, and voila. But it, the reality is usually it is much more complex. You introduce some specialized system for your, for your specialized use cases. And the only thing I would like to say is that you really should understand the tools you are using, the tools you are introducing to, to, to Prod, because it's really tempting to introduce a new technology. These are logos of, of technologies in big data landscape. It's tempting to onboard all of them, but that's not very practical. Think twice, make sure you understand the problem and you get the right tool. Maybe the tools you already have are sufficient. And also, it's quite important to, to have, uh, have a good separation between your teams. So make sure your data, if you are a data analyst, that you are not really exposed to JVM problems and stuff like that. This is DevOps responsibility. On the other hand, you should have some, um, some common tools and common knowledge about like, the, the problems you will have to face anyway, like, like the ones I, I showed you. The last picture for today I want to show you is uh, the hierarchy of needs in data science. So the top of the triangle is like AI, deep learning, all these fancy buzzwords, everybody, everybody wants to do them. And I would say it's completely fine to get, a, get the data in, in your pocket, bring it in your pocket on a pen drive and do some dirty POC but it works like once on, or twice. But if you want to have reliable, reli reliable um, data-driven driven software, you have to be able to rely on the data you build on top of. So bottom of this triangle is 
super important that you can rely on the ingestion mechanism that you know that the data you bring is of good quality. So three bullet points for today is that Spark can help you with processing data at scale. It is quite tricky, so it, it, it really helps if you know how it works. And you should think, if you are building data pipelines and, and uh, products on top of that, you should think about the bottom of the triangle I showed you. In first place, you should get some discipline when you, when you, bring, in, when you bring in your data. Okay, I would be happy to answer your questions. And follow me on, on Twitter, I, I described some of the, some of the problems uh, on, on, on a blog post.